Hello, hello. Hello. Hey, what's up? Not much. How are you doing? Um, pretty good. Great. So I'm uh, thrilled to talk to you. You're uh, apparently the man to debate about socialism these days. That's interesting because I don't, <laughs> I don't tangle much with socialism, but that seems to be all the rage these days. How's it going? It's going pretty well. So, do you know anything about me? Um, some vague affiliation with like Michael Brooks or whatever. Or not that your affiliation is vague, but I, I don't know much about like a lot of people. Yeah, I, I, you know he's um, uh, he's an author mm -hmm. for the imprint that I'm the publishing manager for. I manage zero books which is a uh, actually out of the uk but i'm in the u.s obviously and uh so I, I i publish books for zero books i run a podcast i have for about a decade um called zero squared which is a dumb name but that's what it's called okay and i am also on youtube but i'm also a novelist um actually started podcasting back in 2008 uh when i got my first book deal and then it looked like because of the economic crisis I wasn't sure that the book was ever going to come out if all in New York was going to the publishing industry was going to collapse I wasn't sure what's going on mm -hmm. and uh, I started podcasting kind of in response to the economic crisis back in 2008 um, and became a slowly but surely became a Marxist as I investigated that crisis so that's my little story Okay, cool. But everything is like working like pretty good now, I guess. You're still yep. working there, so that's awesome. Yeah, everything. Yeah, I started working in for Zero Books back in uh, 2014 or 2015. So it was a while between when I started podcasting and when I got a regular gig. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, cool. So what do we? So what have you been debating? Uh, I'm I'm assuming I'm on your stream now. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, we're live. Yeah, I've been streaming all day, so, yeah. yeah. Right. So what have you been debating with, uh, you know, the different, like, what did you and Michael Brooks talk about? Or more importantly, what did you and Muk talk about? I, that's Or Zizizi or whatever his name was. Um, was. Okay, so, well, I, so I guess here, broadly I'll describe my, my two or three problems, and then we, I can talk more specifically about them. So my big problem is that, um, is that, um, fuck, I have so many problems, actually. Well, let me open a little notepad so I can get my thoughts organized. Okay, so here are a couple of like huge problems right now that I have with like um, with I'll use the term lefties online, and when I say lefty, I mean it in the broader sense of being like a socialist or communist, like a anti-liberal, I guess, or whatever. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, sure. So my first problem is all the it seems like all the big like lefty people or a lot of them are like tankies. <laughs> which is like really weird to me. Or if they're not tankies, they have like, um, or and I don't know, maybe you are, I'm sorry. I actually, I'm not 100% your background. I'm not, a, I'm not a tanky. Okay, yeah. So like I'm in this weird area. So <clears throat> I have no idea how much you know about me, but like kind of like one of the things that I do online is I do, well, I'm known for video games, which is my background. And then I do like a lot of political or philosophical debate. And for a mm -hmm. long time, my kind of like my eyes were set on kind of like alt writers. So I am very firmly like a progressive or a sock them. And um, mm -hmm. I feel like, I was kind of disappointed because like um, most of the like empirical fact-based arguments like seem to support the left, like climate change is supported by the left, like immigration is supported by the left, you know, and there's like empirical data to showcase all of this. So, I, you know, most of my debates would be against like writers and alt writers. And I noticed that a lot of people do this like very weird, like crypto fascist, like signaling dog whistling stuff that like made me really uncomfortable. So are you familiar with, like Lauren Southern? Yeah. Yeah, so someone like Lauren Southern would say things like, oh, you know, I'm not in, I'm not a white supremacist or whatever, you know, I just want to protect Western values, you know, stuff like that. It's like, okay, so you you, you hate black and brown people. Like, it's okay, you can hold, say Hold it. on one yeah, second. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. My kid, who actually is a uh, knows of you and told me that you are the person who revealed John Tron's alt-right connections or something, just walked into my room to ask me how he can watch. So he'll be oh. on my... <laughs> side here yeah sure thing but uh, yeah that was like a big thing i kind of did as well right as i talked to john I was, i'm not trying to like expose anybody but i was talking to him and he kind of like inadvertently like started spewing a whole bunch of like poll talking points uh, from the politics board on 4chan which was like really yeah. weird yeah um but not bad for john tron because he's this guy he's just some guy some kid originally who got famous on youtube and then had the unfortunate experience of speaking in a with a massive venue about things he knew nothing about mm -hmm. you know 
<laughs> but this is a lot of people's like normal experience with politics as you start reading some stuff about like Pizzagate or QAnon and you're like, hey, I don't know, this sounds pretty convincing. And before you know it, like people like my mom will email me stuff about QAnon, you know, so I'm like, hey, sweetie, like read this. It seems interesting. I'm like, oh, God, mom. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah. I've ran into this thing with lefties where, and I call them like crypto tankies now, where like, and, and it's like, it, it's like the same experience that I've had with, with, with the crypto fascist people where I'll walk into somebody's channel, they've got like a hammer and sickle flag in the background. They've got like the big like Soviet Union block text. They call each other comrades. They've got the big red flags and their community is full of like it's very staunch, like these people are anti-Hong Kongers, they defend a lot of the USSR or Mao's regimes, you know, they cut like, and it's like, holy shit, like, why are so many people online, like, engaged in this, like, tanky stuff? Like, it feels really weird. And I think it gives me a bad impression, because I don't think that all lefties are going to come out and, like, defend Stalin. But I don't know, the online communities, like, bend, like, really far, like, authoritarian left, and I don't know why that is. So that's, like, my well, first thing, go for it. I think we can, like, I want to address the two things, because you're really talking about two separate things, which is, one is, why are there so many tankies? Mm -hmm. And there are, I think, a lot. But then the other one is, why do so many left channels, uh, you know, not shy away from... Embracing uh, them. Image, embracing, like, some of the imagery, like, you know, the sickle and, uh, hammer and sickle, or the, or talk, calling each other comrade, or making gulag jokes, or things like that. And I will say that I'm not innocent when it comes to making gulag jokes i don't have a hammer and sickle uh in my iconography in any of the channels or anything but my son uh ben who's my older son has a hammer and sickle shirt that he bought in order to go to a libertarian um conference and and he wanted to ask a question from the audience and thought it would be fun to wear that shirt at the same time i, I guess what i'd say about not about tankies, but about the, the dog whistles towards uh, hardcore communism mm -hmm. is that, in my opinion, the communist experience, what the, even including the what happened to it with Stalinism, um, has a different character than the fascist experience because the communist experience was at least begun with the aim of human emancipation. With Lefties, LMAO. Emancipation. It was a massive failure, and a lot of and, and a lot of a lot of corpses laid on top of that experiment. And it's nothing to embrace in its in, in you know in its entirety, but it just doesn't have the same character. So I don't feel the same way about a sickle and hammer as I do about a swastika. Okay, sure. So, do you um do you have like a philosophy background at all? If I use any of these words, yeah, or? I have a philosophy degree. Okay, cool, awesome. Okay, cool. Well, in that case, if I use any words incorrectly, feel free to correct me. So, okay. when you say that um when you say that your movement, or maybe not your movement, I'll say, but like when you talk about like tankies or like the hardcore communism starting off with the goal of broadly emancipating people, that that claim it feels very circular to me, or like we're begging the question because. Theoretically, I could go to any movement, and we'll, we'll use Nazism, obviously, because it's, it's, it'll be the one I'll go to, right? And Nazism started off with the goal of broadly emancipating people. Um, you know, in, in one way, you know, under Mao or under Stalin or even Lenin, like, we target, like, wealthy people or capital owners, and we say all these people need to die because they're destroying society, because they're leeches, because they're taking over everything. And we can point to Nazism and show similar things. You know, Jewish people were very wealthy in many parts of society. They targeted the Jews. They wanted to get rid of them because they thought they were destroying society as well. Um, I, I don't know if like that claim saying like, well, we started off with well, the idea of broad you, emancipation. You've conflated, yeah, go you've for conflated it. trying to improve society mm -hmm. with the goal of human emancipation. So the difference is that the Soviet uh, experiment held this idea of, of a universal humanity uh, as part of its project. There wasn't, it wasn't a, a project to protect one society or one people from an, a, an outside group, but a, a, a project to try to change the foundation of the social order. Yeah, but when that foundation so that like has emancipated. things baked into it, like de re decriminal or recriminalizing like homosexuality and stuff, like I, that's a, I don't know. It feels like it's just like every other authoritarian esque movement, like where maybe like at its roots, I guess, in some like pure form, it can be good. Well, um, I, let me, I want to quote yeah, like, go for it. Zizek mm -hmm. uh, on this. I mean, Zizek is a big critic of, of Stalin, obviously, 
most people who are on the left today would be critics of Stalin, uh, you know, unless they're going to hide in someone's basement. Um, uh, but Zizek says that if you want to understand the difference between the terrible totalitarian nature of the Stalinist regime and uh, the fascist regime, you can think about how people in Stalin's labor camps were kind of made to send Stalin birthday cards. Whereas nobody who was in a concentration camp uh, during, you know, uh, Nazis reign would ever be made to send a birthday card to Hitler. And the reason why is because the, the Jews weren't considered to be part of any universal humanity who needed to participate in such a social expression. Right. They they were beneath contempt to a uh, birthday card from a Jew at that time would have been. An insult to Hitler to have such a thing, whereas, you know, there was this kind of glimmer of redemption left uh, for the people in Siberia. Um, but look, I think that what we're I don't want to split hairs here and say mm -hmm. that, oh, well, you know, the, the overall, the Soviet deaths don't count or I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying that uh, when it comes to like looking at 1917 and the Russian Revolution at its outset, I can't help but feel some sympathy for the workers and even with uh, the Bolsheviks who were trying to overthrow the czar and set up a more just society. And I, I never, I don't feel any sympathy for any of the Nazis ever. And it's not just because I'm call myself left and they're on the right, but it's because of their vision and their vision. The anti-Semitism is key, but it's not just key because, you know, you shouldn't be, racist against Jewish people, but because of the ideology that anti-Semitism reflects, which is that the world as it is would be just, but for some outsider, but for some alien force, but for the Jews. Whereas you never would find anything like that on the left. The left understands its project to be the development of humanity and not the, uh, not the rooting out of the enemy. The, the idea of, on the left is that our, our aim should be uh, to create a better society because the difficulties are systemic and structural within the society uh, I, and not the blame of any particular group. Sure. I guess like um, I don't have the like I, I don't have the, the historical background to split hairs too far here. So, I mean, I, I, if we, depending on how deep we go, I guess um, I, I'm, I'll be forced to concede. But like I, I don't understand how you can say that you weren't sympathetic towards the foundation of, of like the Nazi party, but you are sympathetic towards the foundation of of like the, the revolution in Russia um, when it seems like a lot of these movements were largely born out of the same types of things. So for instance, like when Hitler began the Nazi party, right? He calls it Nazi national socialism, um, not initially because it, it was going to, to be finally like a socialist party, but because they were trying to appeal to all of those same workers and to try to draw those people in early on when that party was starting. Like, it seems like a lot of those movements started in, in kind of like similar ways. People were discouraged with the current establishment, um, Germany in particular, post-World War One and Treaty of Versailles were like super destroyed as a country. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, like, not to say that, like, um, I, I don't know if it sounds like Nazi apology. I'm not obviously saying that killing Jews or any shit the Nazis did was good, of course. Um, right. But I mean, like, I can't help but feel a little sympathetic towards a country that was, like, single-handedly, you know, handed the entire debt of World War One, and its people were, were forced to bore that. Like, Sure, I feel sympathy for the German people, and I don't feel, I, I understand how a reactionary movement built, can be built out of the ruins of something like World War um, One, mm -hmm. right? And I, I understand uh, that the reasons behind the appeal uh, for the Nazis or the fascists in Italy were not dissimilar for the reasons behind the appeal of the Soviets or the Bolsheviks or mm -hmm. socialism. Like the same problems are generating both kinds of reaction, but I can see that there's a different in the difference in the reaction. That the socialist reaction is aiming not at uh, trying to, first of all, not tr trying to correct the system that is. It's not trying to say, okay, well, we've got a rot in the system because of this group and, or that group, and we need to um, return to the foundation of this society, which would be just otherwise. But rather, the out of, if coming out of Marxism particularly, and I have, you know, some, I've read some Marx, um, it's saying, well, even at its best, this society 
will go into crisis. This society promotes inequality. This society um, is filled with contradictions and, uh, you know, will never be able to fully realize its own uh, ambitions or, or best principles. Do you think that... Um... <clears throat> So here's kind of an interesting question. But, but I want think, to go back to the. We, I, eventually, I'd like to talk about tankies because yeah, for sure. Yeah, we will. About, I'm, I'm just. I'm really curious on this line of thought because people seem to draw these like um. So like earlier, so if you would have asked me a year ago, am I okay drawing like an extreme line between like Nazism and 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 kind of. I don't know if you call it tankism or Stalinism or whatever. I, you know, I, I would usually say yes. Um, but now I'm really uncomfortable doing it because I didn't realize how many people unironically defend like Stalin's administration or Mao. Uh, like, and now it's made me really uncomfortable. And now like I really want to go back and, and retake a look at me um, like, well, what, what are these like concrete differences between Nazism and communism? And, and like, um, or, or I shouldn't say Nazism and communism, but Nazism and Stalinism, I should say, I guess. Um, when, when when you look at when you talk about how like I'm, so here's like a hypothetical do you think nazism would be okay or this form of fascism would be a, like more acceptable if it didn't have like the anti-semitism baked into it well sure if, it, but i don't think it would be i mean i don't think it would be good mm -hmm. i don't think it would be uh, a liber you know a liberating force in the world if you just had a fascist government that wasn't built on scapegoating a, pop a part of its own population sure um I don't know if you could have that, but, you know, I'm against um, the, the idea of state regulation of the culture and that kind of authoritarian structure, you know, to begin with. So, you know, the, I'm against just the fascist state. And, and for a similar reason, I'm against what happened in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, 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 I kind of want to talk to you as a fellow liberal, and this is going to make my own audience irritated with me probably, but sure. um, the, the fact is that the Marxist ambition or the ambition of socialism is to realize the principles that, were, that came out of the Enlightenment and came out of uh, the bourgeois revolutions, say, that um, you know, the idea of fraternity, liberty, equality mm -hmm. are the foundations of liberal democracy are not principles that socialists want to toss aside neither does a, a real marxist want to abandon the uh, rights of the individual or the uh, self-determination of the individual mm -hmm. um in in fact from my understanding we want to realize yeah socialists would argue that well the self-determination of an individual is actually greater under a socialist system versus a capitalist one or whatever right right yeah right. sure but under an actual socialist system but then we have to start talking about what is socialism and it's not an easy thing to nail down mm -hmm. one of the things about the marxist project i mean if you've talked to a variety of socialists you probably have noticed that there's not always every a single one is different has a different label right. or has a different ideology or a different belief about a particular right. thing yeah yeah and that's because you know, the, historically, we failed <laughs> is, I think, one reason why that's the case. The other reason why is because the kind of, um, because it's not being, socialism isn't strictly being built on its own, like, blueprint. Mm -hmm. Socialism is uh, being built out of the contradictions within this society, mm -hmm. too. So uh, it can be as fragmented as the society that's, that's building it. And it, it's a struggle to try to get beyond that, to transcend that fragmentation. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, for me, what I've done or try to do is go back to Marx and read Marx as well as I can, not because I feel like he was some deity who had it all right, but because out of my experience of 2008 and watching the financial crisis, when I asked people what was going on, it was Marxist economists who made the most persuasive, persuasive argument for me. And uh, I came to believe that Marx's critique of political economy and capital was to a large degree correct. But the, the other thing I came to realize is that that critique doesn't have, doesn't come along with a very clear political program. So sure. that's another reason why there's so much diversity in amongst socialists. The, and then another reason why is because again, if you go back to the origins of socialism, it was a diverse movement. I mean, the thing that Marx was doing primarily was critiquing other socialists. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's another reason 
why okay. there was so much diversity. But what I would say to people who I'm trying to get involved with socialism, and I'll let you talk, mm -hmm. but it's just that the task is to kind of join in the struggle to understand more than it is to join one strand or another. We need to, we're at a moment of crisis now where we really do need to rethink. And the socialist project broadly is, can we think past the current system? Do we think it's necessary to have a radical change? Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. So, okay. I guess we can hop into my next point. So I, so, so the first one, my first problem with lefties is like the amount of like crypto tanky apology that goes on makes me like super ultra uncomfortable. Um, I, there's like a couple more things that we could dive into there, but I guess we can kind of move past that. Or, well, or... I want to talk about tankies a little bit because mm -hmm. it seems to me that if you want to understand why there's such an, I mean, there's a couple I'm not exactly sure why the Soviet Union is attractive or why Maoism or Stalinism would sure. be attractive. To it feels anyone. reactionary, but yeah, go ahead. It does. And um, I feel as though part of the reasons I'm 48, right? So like I actually remember the Soviet Union. Okay. And um, I, so I also came out of a time where, you know, I didn't read Marx for a long, long time because he was just evil. Yeah, because everybody in America is this dumb. Socialism is when you kill everybody and take all the wealth from the rich. And get, it's real dumb American shit, you know? Or yeah. actually, wait, are you American? I'm sorry, I don't actually... I'm American. Yeah, totally okay, yeah, American. yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I grew up in an ultra-Republican, ultra-conservative... So I know that, like, yeah. Like, what is communism? Communism is when you literally kill every single person. And, yeah, it's like the... Yeah, the real dumb shit. Right. So I have I have a memory of the Soviet Union, and I also have some indoctrination against mm -hmm. the old Soviets, right? Yeah. So uh, take what I'm saying with a, a little a pinch of salt. But um, my feeling is that what people can't think beyond now or some of the property relations and uh, kind of the economic realities that determine society, uh, but that what they want is a radical break. And the last time there was any real attempt at that was in the Soviet Union. And so... Because of that, there's an appeal that's appealing. It's also because, for whatever reason, in the third world, Stalinism or Marxist-Leninism hasn't ever really gone away. I was just on a live stream uh, for a capital reading group I'm running, and uh, Ernesto, who lives in Mexico, said that a lot of the people who he talks to on the Marxist left are, are Marxist-Leninists in Mexico. And um, that he sort of argues with them. I mean, not, not, not that he's trying to convince them overnight or something or but that there's a tendency there and i think it's that's based on my instinct is to say that's based on the uneven development between the nations that uh -huh. stalinism might look pretty good can i can i ask a real question just to make sure that i know this i'm sorry because people everybody's defined things in so many different ways um when you when you say marxist leninist you're you're talking about like specifically like the kind of like the stalinist idea that there has to be like a vanguard party to help the transition from capitalism into the end state of socialism communism right or is there a different thing you mean there i'm just i you know i'm just using it as the same thing as stalinist so, okay so okay yeah, yeah okay I'm just the main sure. thing for me okay. is not the avant-garde not the vanguard party mm -hmm. so much as the, the state Okay, gotcha. Right okay, the, cool. The economy. So, in the Stalinist perspective, I, I think broadly is that if you uh, have, if the state holds all the property and is the primary employer and regulates society in total, that that's socialism. Okay, cool. It may not be communism, but that's socialism. Gotcha. Uh, but my view of what defines Stalinism is quixotic, but but that's to me because I hold with the theory that. The Soviet Union was not socialist, but was state capitalist. Mm -hmm. And and I can explain why I hold with that theory. It has to do with the fact that they were still exploiting workers for value, that the society still had an economy based primarily on labor time mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. But um, so that's my definition of Marxist Leninism. But really, I'm just saying Stalinist, you know, basically people who uh, are not concerned at all with trying to realize liberal ideals, but actually consider themselves to be anti-liberal and pro-state. Uh, and like, I, there's someone who follows my YouTube uh, videos who's constantly, I don't know who they are, but they're called like social socialist justice warrior or something like that. Okay, sure. And, and uh, he or she is constantly trying to belittle me and say things like, 
we don't need you know individual freedom we need socialist freedom through the socialist state which to me just means like yeah <laughs> you know get on your jack boots and stamp around and because that doesn't make any damn sense at all but. sure yeah i mean i can kind of understand it i'm like i'm sympathetic to illiberal people i don't i don't have a problem with people that are anti-liberalism um as long as they're not like <laughs> like full-on tankies or aren't going to start engaging in like insane like mao or stalin apologia but um but sure well, okay. I, I have a problem with anybody who thinks that they're a marxist socialist uh embracing uh you know s statism as mm -hmm. if that's really that was the end goal because even lenin argued that the state you know under socialism would have to wither away that the state was by its very nature only part of the class society and so on so i don't i don't appreciate people who claim to be the same thing i am acting as illiberals if they want to be right-wing reactionaries i'll debate them or whatever but when they take my label it irritates me sure um okay in that case um well, okay, I'm just writing these points down for things I'm curious. So here's like one big problem. Um, if I wanted to be, um, I'm generalizing a little bit, but if I wanted to be like a conservative, like there's like a couple of like basic things that I need. Like I have to believe in like that company or that government is evil. And, you know, we really like white people. And it seems like as long as I have that, I can fit into like a ton of different conservative movements. It feels like, um, it feels like with leftist movements, the infighting is like insane that there is like no consistent definition. Like, so for instance, like people make fun of me sometimes when I start debating somebody and I ask somebody, well, what do you mean when you say you're an anarcho-communist? And like, the reason I ask is because I actually get like a variety of definitions for every single, and these are, and maybe it feels like cherry picking, mm -hmm. but like these are people like 50 to 250,000 subs on YouTube and they get posted a lot on Reddit and stuff. And like, everybody has like wildly different ideas about what it is they want. And if you disagree on like any individual point, you're like an absolute bootlicker, right-wing trash. Um, what how, What is... Yeah, what, what are your thoughts on, like, the, 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 the disunity seems extreme? Well, I, you know, I, I would say that it's partly due to the history of the left and the failures of the left, and it's partly to do with the fragmentation of, you know, any political project and for... Yeah, yeah, that's not good. That's just me repeating myself. Let me think about that for a second, because... Mm -hmm. um, it's a real problem just in terms of the literature, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you, if you want to dive into um, Marxism and the history of Marxism, which will include some anarchists, mm -hmm. um, you're going to find a massive diversity of opinion. The other thing is that when you join organizations, these sort of small sectarian organizations of different types, you're not going to read broadly no one wants to give you like this you know broad overview of the history of socialism as you get involved they're going to give you their flavor of right yeah whatever the guru's favorite you know uh, theorist is might be read or you probably the guru him or herself mm -hmm. will be read um and so now, why is that the case? It, I, I do think it has to do with the defeats that the especially Western left faced, um, that there's never been a real, in America especially, real strong revolutionary socialist party um, has something to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, but also, about, I think it has to do with our individualism here. But to to back up and speak more philosophically and more broadly, I think it's because what the left is trying to do is a lot more difficult than what the right's trying to do. Yeah, I mean, I would argue that, like, the right seems generally concerned with maintaining the status quo and the left wants to change it, so the left's fight is necessarily going to be harder, right, just by virtue of, of trying to, the inertia of moving all of society in a different direction than what it's right. already at, yeah. And also, what we want to create isn't, hasn't existed already. Mm -hmm. It's not like we have a good map as to what we want to do. We just, we're trying to figure out what a better society would be from within this one. Mm -hmm. And it's only relatively recently that the idea that people, everyday people should have the right to change society mm -hmm. has been, you know, on the table. Sure. Okay. So 
I was gonna say this like this leads me into like kind of like my third problem um, that that comes like right off the heel of this, and it's my it's one of my biggest problems. Um, when I talk about when I talk to people on the right, my what I really enjoy talking about is policy because we can go to the data, we can see how things work, we can talk about the impacts of a certain thing. Um, if if somebody were to tell me that they wanted to make the U.S. like a socialist nation, and then they were to give me like a handful of policies that I could evaluate like on a step by step basis, I would love that. But it seems like whenever I talk to or actually broadly, almost in, in every socialist I've talked to, when it's like, okay, well, what policies would you suggest? I get some vague callback to like, well, what we really need is a global socialist revolution, like full stop. <laughs> and then that's it. And it's like, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, okay. Right. <laughs> like, that's how does this help the average worker that makes 25,000 a year that's trying to feed like, you know, like as a single parent, like this doesn't get us anywhere. This is like a pipe dream. Like, Yeah, well, that's a, that's right. And that's, um, I agree with you that that's the idea that we could just have global revolution tomorrow is wrong. I mean, I think it's wrong anyway. Um, I find that kind of I have an opposite problem, which is although I, I um, uh, don't dislike these people, I, I spend some time listening to blogging heads. You ever listen to blogging heads? Nope. I'm super stretched on time, unfortunately. So it's really hard to listen yeah. to stuff unless you don't stream, but yeah. Blogging heads is this real centrist online um, video publication so they and they have journalists from like the new republic and uh, the nation maybe i'm you know for, you know washington post on all the time mm -hmm. and uh, people coming out of think tanks and stuff and uh so like one of their major uh hosts is um this guy named glenn lowry who was a former member of the heritage foundation but then he kind of moved to the uh left a little or to the liberal side um, in the 90s because the Heritage Foundation was embracing Charles Murray mm -hmm. and he's black and he just couldn't abide <laughs> with that so he, he left and uh, I find that they're what's really interesting is how ingenuous they are I mean these are people who are seriously concerned about the problems in society mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, really do kind of wrestle with policy problems and there isn't any kind of consensus there either. If you really look at actual politics, you find that it's almost as split up and very gated as the left, um, but only on points that seem like minutia. Uh, but what I will often start shouting at the screen when I'm watching blogging heads and watching some centrist debate, another centrist, is you guys aren't going to be able to solve this until you overcome the fundamental contradictions in society. These are two sides of the same problem that you're, you're addressing. Um, so what I think the task for the left is right now is to develop a political project found based on the foundation of understanding why our society is as messed up as it is. I mean, the first, the, the first step to being a leftist is to decide that there is a need to, for radical change. Mm -hmm. For me, I became a leftist because of the Cold War and the threat of nuclear Armageddon. Like it was, you know, Ronald Reagan and the TV documentary or the TV uh, pseudo documentary the day after and the, the feeling that at any moment all of human history could end in a, with, you know, mushroom cloud. Yeah. And that maybe that I shouldn't at the age of 12 be living with that kind of vision. Uh, was sort of what made me think, oh, yeah, this is something's fundamentally wrong. Um, I, I feel like today the mushroom crowd, cloud is actually still there, but it's sort of forgotten. And then, there, you know, the ecological crisis and uh, threats of, uh, from the far right. And there's just a, a mass of reasons why there needs to be radical change. But then the question is, well, what do we mean by radical? What is the foundation of our society? Mm hmm how how do we make alterations on the uh, on a fundamental level and that's where the debate on the left needs to be and uh from there you can start to develop a political program so like for instance like the idea of a dictatorship of the proletariat which comes out of linen mm -hmm. what is that about well it's not about creating an institution called the state that do, that can then represent the interests of the proletariat indefinitely and kind of s s replace the proletariat and that that's socialism the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat 
is that as the proletariat sees and change the means of production, the dictatorship of the proletariat is basically there to protect. The state is powers there to protect that effort and then uh, to maybe uh, coordinate it, do logistics for it. But then it will slowly fade away. It will become, you know, less and less significant as the new mode of production takes hold and people are more free. Sure. So the question then becomes, okay, if you believe that that's possible, and I don't know if, if, if seizing state power in order to create a, a prolet, you know, a dictatorship of the proletariat is possible or is the correct approach. But if it, if you do, then the, so what are you going to, what are you going to do? Well, you have to build left-wing parties yeah. that communicate yeah. with each other and work together internationally. Mm -hmm. That would be like the first step. It wouldn't be, you know, general strike tomorrow. Yeah. This right. is like, this is one of my, um, this is one of my criticisms of most like third parties in America. And there may, there might be like valid, like electoral or, or subtle reasons, financing reasons that I don't understand for this. But like, I really wish for some of these political movements, whether it's libertarianism or green party people or this, these leftism ideas. Um, I really wish that they would like actually try to build out like candidates in local areas rather than trying to get lucky, like in a presidential election with like a Bernie Sanders type figure or something. Like it would be really interesting to see like socialist experiments, I guess, on a smaller scale. Um, although I guess like well, it seems like well, they you, say you look yeah. at someone like Bernie Sanders and why almost across the board people on the far left mm -hmm. are embracing him and not everyone but a, yeah. a lot well, including myself about half the time mm -hmm. it's because there are two things going on at the same time on the left on the one hand there's this and, and this is I think the smaller aspect of what the left is really doing mm -hmm. there's a desire to create radical change and to create a politics of radical change mm-hmm but then a lot of the time, what the left ends up doing is trying to hold off or mitigate or change the uh, consequences of the system that we have. And in that, when we get reduced to that level, and it's inevitable we are, because practically reduced to that level, If even if we're trying to build radical parties for political change, mm -hmm. we're going to have to deal with the real-life situation on the ground. Mm -hmm. But when, when all of our politics are basically reduced to the level of resistance, resistance to the kind of crushing movement of capital. Yeah. Then you end up with, you know, this move to like, we need to embrace whoever the most left pro uh, candidate is now. Mm -hmm. We need to take state power as it is now. Um, because if we don't, then people like Trump or worse will, uh, you know, run us all into camps or you know, destroy yeah. us. You're basically you're so, talking about like the um you're you're basically talking about the classical struggle between the the reformist versus the um uh, the revolutionary right where some people would argue that reforming a system over and over again is just delaying the inevitable collapse of capitalism and hurting everybody. What we need is like some revolution right now to fundamentally change the system because you can never reform it to socialism. It has to happen like all at once or something, right? Well, the old reformists still even had the aim of ultimately changing the system, right? It was a matter of like implementing the right kinds of reforms through mm -hmm. the uh, i mean like it's debatable as to whether or not marx thought that you could elect in socialism he didn't think you could in some countries he thought it might be possible in others mm -hmm. right um it, it, so reformism in the socialist debate reformism was a path towards radical change but i think today we actually for to a large degree have Except for these tankies, maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> we've sort of uh, a large section of what calls itself the left has forgotten that they're to have a vision for socialism and is mostly just trying to hold on to whatever rights have been won and, and to protect the most vulnerable people and sort of to do this or in this mode of permanent resistance. So I would say there's three things. There's resistance, there's reform. And there was revolution and I would put reform and revolution really on one side of the divide mm -hmm. and resistance on the other. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, so I guess this kind of then bleeds into like my fourth point, um, where one of the things that kind of concerns me is, um, what, what you just mentioned about like, 
patching the current system or doing things to make the current system kind of work versus keeping our, like the more revolutionary ideas in mind. I've noticed this kind of like weird pickup recently from a lot of these left-leaning like uh, communities that has this like shunning of identity politics. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about at all? Or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that it, it almost feels like um, I remember back back when I was an enlightened libertarian and I was like 15 years old in high school or whatever. Um, I had the euphoric idea that there is no such thing as racism or sexism. It's actually all just class. And I was so ingenious for figuring this out. And no black person would ever be discriminated against if they were wealthy. And blah blah blah. And I was in right. I was a high schooler. And and then I grew up a little bit. And it's like okay, well obviously these things exist in in, in a more intersectional manner, right? It's a little bit more complicated than I would have liked to believe. But now it's strange because like I feel now I'm starting to see communities on the left um, do this thing where they are shunning identity politics, saying that it's like a, it's just a distraction from from class conscientiousness or whatever or from class rec- recognition. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is really weird. Well, OK, so I've often been accused of being one of these class reductionist types, mm-hmm. and I'll even sometimes em- embrace the term. But it's. Again, I think that this is what's important here is to see struggles for equality and rights amongst ethnic minorities as a part of maybe a, a project for of a radical project of reform to help in revolutionary struggle. I actually believe that that's absolutely vital. Like under, overcoming discrimination is absolutely vital, especially amongst workers, so that you can organize workers together rather than you know, fracture them apart. <clears throat> yeah, but do, do you think it's a problem when you try to subsume like all minority complaints under like class complaints? Do you think that's damaging at all to their, or, or that could be used to kind of um, like marginalize well, I, their concerns? Well, um, no, I don't think it's, I don't think class and race are similar in any way. Uh-huh. I don't think that, that it's like saying, asking me, oh, you know, if a patient comes in, and uh, I want to talk about illness rather than about, uh, or like I want to talk about physical illness rather than psychological illness or something like that, mm-hmm. right? I mean, like when you're talking about racism and you're not talking about class, you're not talking about anything that's structural. You're talking about maybe psychological attitudes. So without class, there is no structural racism. Well, I guess it would depend on like, um, so, well, let's be specific. Let's talk about like the criminal justice system in the United States. So it seems like the criminal justice system. So when I read an economic study that will control for SES for socio, for socioeconomic factors, right? When I read a study like this, it controls for that and still finds that these racist aspects exist. It seems like taking a class-based approach completely fails here. Like it has to be an intersectional one. Like there is racism against black people in the U.S. regardless of class. Not to say that class can't exacerbate it in some cases. I, um, you know, but, I'd have to look at the study. My guess would be that you don't that what you find is that there's because of racism and things like redlining and the history of oppression uh-huh. of black people in America um, that you would find that the there are more people living in among in poverty and that that sector, which is a sector in every racial group that tends to have more encounters with the police and be criminalized the most um, is larger in certain ethnic minority groups in the United States. And therefore they end up uh, having, you know, more incarceration and so on. I mean, you will probably find racist attitudes. You definitely will find racist attitudes within the cops and you'll definitely find bias within the courts, but those things are built upon kind of a result of the structural uh, component. They wouldn't, they don't exist on their own. They're not grounded on their own they're grounded in these but you don't think that like but the, so that's so the, so this is actually a point i strongly disagree with, so i'm really curious about this because i because i would say i would feel like these are founded on their own um so i would feel that like if we had let's say that we actually had like a perfect um a society where there were no capital owners where all of the workers were kind of in charge of making democratic decisions over the workplace um or maybe it was even a more centrally planned we weren't even doing like state capitalists we weren't having like for-profit like owned businesses that were owned by the state or by workers but literally we had allocation of resources and everything everything was as perfect as could be yeah i feel like in a society like this you could still have like systemic discrimination against either women or black what, people what or kind Hispanic. of system would you be talking about um well so like we could what point to like power be based on in that system <clears throat> well we could point sometimes to like the same wrong. like um sometimes criminal I'm justice right. system well to, to keep things simple i guess like in that same criminal justice system, or actually 
Well, yeah, let's say with the criminal justice system. Uh, well, actually, no, like, let's say let's say that you have like a, a state committee that you have to go to to get approval to start some factory or some shop or some community or whatever, right? Uh -huh. That you could still have a group of people that sit on this community that maybe are less likely to approve um, some resource being allocated to a black community or business versus a white one just because they don't. Wait, yeah. now, now you're talking about a resource allocation. Sure. Which is an economic decision. So try again without using any economic. Okay, well then, I guess we'll stick with the, um, I guess we'll stick with like the, um, we'll, we'll stick with the criminal justice one then. Okay. That like, even in like a perfect like socialist or communist system, you could still have police officers that just want to pull over black people more, or judges that give them harsher sentences, or jailers that treat them worse, right? That, that I, like, I feel like that could still happen in, in any system. I think, I definitely think that it could happen that there would be cops or judges who are biased against this or that um, group but that in a society in which there weren't structural economic material um differences that those groups would have the power i mean to to re get redressed for those kinds of biases that there would be basically something more along the lines of checks and balances there because you wouldn't be talking about a a, a race of people who have more wealth and power you'd only be talking about individual bias well but so like we can't eliminate um so i guess an anarchist if we're coming from an anarch Eight, anarchy perspective months. we're trying to eliminate as many unjust hierarchies as possible i understand that but like in 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 some sort of criminal justice system there is necessarily going to be some group of people who are conferred with some power to lock people yeah. up or to put them in jail right. and these well, people they yeah. would be disproportionately of one race or another would be a less likely because there wouldn't be the material and structural disadvantages. Yeah, but why do you need material race? advantages for white people to just want more white cops or white judges? Well, okay. So what you're saying is that whoever, the, whatever the majority race would be, be would. Yeah, potentially. Like, let's say, like right now, let's say that Tennessee turned into a perfect. Or Louisiana turned into like a perfect um, communist state. Like, would you expect like all of the people they would be voting in, you know, like um, different ethnicities for police chiefs and sheriffs and all sorts of stuff? Or do you think that we would still see racism be pretty pervasive in these communities, even independent material conditions? I would conditions? expect that if we had a, a massive revolution where the material means uh, production were open to, for all people and that everyone had control over their own productive activity and that things weren't distributed. Uh, based on labor time, but were distributed to each according to their ability, uh, um, so from each according to their ability, to each according to their need, that in such a society, the role of the cops would itself be severely diminished, and that while there might still be people with old-timey biases, that the power of regular people, the power of civil society, would be such that that would be a major check against those people. The whole point of, of communism is to uh, create a situation where people are on a material basis and on a social basis empowered okay so okay if you if you ever want to leave on this point you can tell me but i'm just because I, I i disagree so strongly here so i'm just curious okay so yeah. there's two different ways two different things you said that um well let me just ask you yeah. what do you think would ground the power of a white racist cop in the south in a society where there was material equality well, so there might be material equality between people, but I don't think there'd be material equality between between groups of people. So, like, if there's still like a white majority population, and some of them hold, why why why, why wouldn't there be material equality between groups? Because there's more white people than black people, unless you're literally talking about equating the wealth between entire groups of people. But then you would make the society very unequal between the individual people. So, like for instance, let's say I, have, so, I, mean, I think yeah. we need to talk about what we're what we mean by uh -huh. socialism and what we mean by class, because I think sure. you and I have very different understanding of those things. Okay, yeah, like, go for it. I mean, I think that you, you're, what you're thinking about maybe is like everyone would make the same wage or something like that. Well, okay. no. so in my understanding of most communist and social systems, well, if we're talking full on communism, then you'd be allocated what you would need to have like a good life. It would, you wouldn't get like a different wage, right? Your allocation would be based w -E -O -W on need, right? W-E-O-W 777. Your allocation would be based on need and but what would determine your need is what productive activity you were dis you were driven to do. What do you mean by that? I mean, productive work would be or 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 another way to put it would be civic participation because we might even have automation. 
-hmm. Productive work would be the primary want in life. To be involved in your community and to be contributing to it would be your primary want in life. So depending on the kinds of things that you wanted to do, that would determine your needs. It wouldn't be like some baseline, you get this many calories a day. It would be based on uh, some sort of economic process where uh, the collectivity would invest time and energy to do certain kinds of things, and the resources would be generated to support that. It, okay, okay, I have to be misunderstanding you. So, because it sounds like we're just creating more hierarchies. Then, like, we, are you saying like, or or rather like, so are, how would you how would you allocate like would more resources be allocated to like computer programmers than garbage men because their work is more advantageous to society? Or what do you? I guess what do you mean by that? Or I'm curious what you mean by that. Well, okay, the a lot of uh, garbage. Okay. It's not a matter. Of, well, first of all, what it was it? What would it be to be advantageous to society? Well, I don't so, know. You would have to define that, I guess. Yeah, it depends. In capitalism, it's creating more profit, right? So, but in your system, I'm not right. To yeah. So, what would be more most advantageous is would be determined by basically what people were driven to do and produce together. The, it would be a free. Like right now, we have a this sort of relative equality in the market right where, oh. where people you know it's not real equality because the material ba f foundation for that equality is in un unequal but when but the idea is that everybody has the same right to go and purchase what they need mm -hmm. whether it's land or or food stuff or consumer goods or, or or productive property that that's what that's the level of equality so the kind of socialist vision I have is that, that would be inverted the, the 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 realm of the market would even be kind of a second thought you know just an afterthought and the realm of equality would be in pro production so you would you know you would be generating you'd be so productive at this point that it would be relatively easy to support different activities based on what people wanted to do Sure, I guess, but, but like, I mean, but I mean, this is my own maybe, mm -hmm. you know, vision of socialism. But the point here is that if you take away material inequality between people individually, you're also going to be eliminating material inequality between groups. Mm -hmm. So then you're not going to have material inequality between. <laughs> black people and white people in a socialist country, in sure. an actual socialist country. Yeah, so when I said between groups of people, what I'm saying is like, if there are like twice as many like white people as black people, like what, what are the protections that black people have? Or why do you think that material equality would somehow protect them from oppression, especially in a more democratic society well, from the white uh, people? The material, the, the, okay, if there are more white people than black people, there wouldn't be more power in the white collectivity than there would be in the black collectivity unless for some cultural reason, people try to impose their will, uh, you know, just in a kind of naked and brutal Wait, way. real quick. When you say white collectivity versus black collectivity, you mean like these two groups would have equal power or? No, I mean, the, the, uh, right now, the way that groups obtain power is by accumulating capital and, and political power out of that, right? So... In a communist society, anyway, you wouldn't be there would be no capital. So what you'd be dealing with are individuals primarily. Well, but you still and, have you still vote on things, right? Because especially in a communist yeah, so or what socialist society, yeah. So we're going back and let's go back. What you're worried about is that in a actual democratic society based on real material equality, that whatever the majority race is mm -hmm. would vote their brothers or sisters into uh, a secondary position sure yeah and that but that would have to be maintained i guess just by brute force well so like okay uh, and and i'm not sure how that could even be maintained yeah i so i know we say that we okay i have to push back against this as well so when because these are, i always get these really incredulous claims like well i don't know how you could even maintain that brute force so one of the lines you used earlier is that you want people to have more power to give power back to the people one yeah. of the ultimate expressions of power to the people is when people in the south would lynch black people this was free of judicial systems right lynching by definition is extrajudicial this was a people yeah. exercising their individual wills and rights free of capital free of class free of the state and they went out and they found black people 
people and they sprang up on a train. Lynching was free of class, and I wouldn't say that those people that it was extra judicial and extra legal. I, I so I would say it's necessarily free of class because black Why? people weren't also, lynched because they were poor, right? They were lynched because they were black. Well, they were the lynching was allowed to continue because of the difference in material power between the two communities. Well, yeah, you say allowed to continue, but in your society, I mean, it I would mean, always be continuing, always right? Killed. I mean, we wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest a society where someone where we're going to never have a murder, right? But for there to be an organized, sustained attack against a population, like that the KKK, population would have to be undermined politically, socially, and materially. Well, I mean, I think that just them and being a minority material... would be enough. No, like if, if you have a minority population, you could subjugate these people forever, especially without protection from a state like an anarcho communist wouldn't necessarily want to stay or any form of communist wouldn't necessarily want to stay. So I don't see how without a protection from a state, a minority peoples can be expected to protect themselves. Okay. So now now mm -hmm. what we're talking about is um, this sort of uh, I've been pushed into this anarchist position. Sure. Where, yeah, I don't mean to. If, 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 if you ever feel like found, you're not really asking me about uh, race so much now, you're asking me about. What is the, what force is going to create authority in a future society to stop people from organizing collectively to do criminal activity? And that they, and you're suggesting that they, this will be wanted. Well, I wouldn't even say this is of whether or not people. I are, wouldn't even say this is like criminal activity. Um, like, well, what is it then? Do you think that it's not criminal to lynch people in a communist society? Well, do you think it, that not, that's going to be like the accepted norm? It could be, no, yeah. Well, wait, 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 wait. Criminal activity. Well, so in a communist society where we don't have a government with a jurisdiction and the rules are decided based on the people there because you because you want to democratize these processes as much as possible free of class, if these people say that we should be allowed to lynch people, then by definition, yeah, it wouldn't be a criminal activity. It would be those people exercising their freedoms, like the Ku Klux Klan well, exercised what, their freedoms, what, right? It, right. I mean, now we're getting into the weeds of like how we imagine a alternative judicial system and criminal uh, system from to enforce law would be the the you know the i'm just going to give you my pie-eyed optimistic view here which is that if you had material equality between people the propensity for criminal activity and murderous activity uh, would be diminished certainly there wouldn't be theft right um uh, not on any grand scale and well, this. So, well, I, I feel like there's really bad undertones here. When you say there wouldn't be theft because there wouldn't be material inequality, do you think, like, for instance, like black people only steal because white people are wealthy, or, or what? What is? I mean, like, I don't. I think, think that, anyone's I, most. I think people steal to gain material advantage, whether that's just to feed themselves. And I wasn't talking about. Uh, black people stealing per, per se. I was just saying there wouldn't be theft. Sure, but right now um, in America, our big crime problems are with like the black community. Like that's one of the huge problems we have in the United States. Well, not in, not in, not in, now. Uh, you know, you've uh, argued with the alt right. I think purport mm -hmm. like maybe there's a disproportionate level of crime in black community. Yes, but yeah. by far the majority of of criminals in America are white. Yeah, but we don't care about absolute numbers. We care about proportional per capita numbers, right? And per capita, black Why? people. Why? Well, Why wouldn't I care about total numbers? I would rather reduce crime. You know, if, if, like, for instance, I would rather live in a society where white people didn't commit any crimes and a few ethnic minorities did. That well, wait, we, well, we care about proportional numbers because we because th that means there's a problem. Right. So like if we have a society with a thousand people and 100 of them are black and 900 of them are white and we have 150 white criminals and 95 black criminals, that's it. We have a huge problem. The goal wouldn't be like, well, we need to figure out how to reduce all crime. We would say, like, well, there's a massively disproportionate problem affecting some group of people. We need to figure out what that problem is. The per capita is really important, right? The absolute. Well, okay. My primary, what I'm concerned with here is not primarily crime, um, but, you know, the, amongst individuals, but more systemic problems. But well, per capita would, shows actually, systemic, I right? would actually, yes. I would say, look, if we could work on the problem of crime reduction, so that the overall massive number goes down rather than trying to be proportional that we're obviously going to be smarter if we try to bring down the total number that that will do the best for our society well but we don't if we, like if we if we you know there's lots of different ways to make things proportional 
one would be okay well let's drive up the white rate of crime there, no I, like I mean, the reason what, why we so talk you, about proportional or per capita is because so for instance there might be some natural level of crime that will always exist in a society even in a perfect utopia there's probably going to be some percentage of people that commit crime if we see right. that one group of people is disproportionately committing crime over another group of people then what it shows is there's probably some underlying problem there that can be solved if white people yeah. commit crime what at one percent and black Destiny, what it shows is inequality between between the groups that's the primary thing that it shows it well, shows primarily material inequality between the groups that's but, why you but have that, but that's i i've asked that but that doesn't seem to be borne out historically so for instance when we look at like black wall street like that was a wealthy black community that was burned down by poor white people right this wasn't a class inequality no, when we look at things like about theft well, okay. I mean, we can use theft as one example, but like my, my we all were my, talking about, now my, you're shifting a totally diff, to, totally different circumstance to why we're competing capitalists willing to uh, kill each other along racial lines is a completely different question than what what an overall crime rate, you know, and disproportionality amongst just everyday people reflect. What kind of what kind of problems does that reflect? Well, I guess what I, I was mean, trying to say, the history of America is a history of uh, the oppression of. Uh, ethnic minorities and largely that's included but i don't think that it was that that's driven just out of some innate character of, of any population um i don't think that it's you know that just the character of white people that they hate black people or the character of australians that they hate new zealanders or whatever i i feel as though what drive what drove racism for instance uh, what drove the slave trade was the motivation and the propulsion to maximize a certain kind of value in a newly developing economic world. But this and this makes it sound like racism is literally like the result of like capitalism or something. I do believe that. I 100% believe, 100 believe that racism is a consequence of the capitalist system. Just so, but so is the nation state as we know it. You know, it's that, that wouldn't have existed as we know it without, without a capitalist order. I mean, capitalism does a massive amount of things to the world. It changes our social organization dramatically. It brings people together. I mean, centralization and accumulation of some of the things it does are good. Like, it centralizes power and brings people together on massive collective. Like, if this was true, then why didn't we go to poor white countries and enslave those people? Like, why was it uh, mainly African slave trades that, that filled, like, so much of our early, like, agricultural industry? Well, and probably there's a variety of reasons why it was... I know, I'm not a historian, so I don't know exactly why. It's obviously easier to dislike people who look different than you do. I mean, it, I'm not saying there's no tribalism or no uh, tendency to, you know, form identities. But I'm just saying that racism, as we know it, came out of capitalism. And, and that you would never see anything like the slave trade in a system that wasn't based on capitalism. You never did. You, there, never in history before the nothing 1800s like or whatever, you never saw large groups no, of like, like racial nothing people like, subjugated. Like chattel slavery, no. There was, what about like the caste system in India or anything? Yeah, like there's nothing like it. That is absolutely nothing like it. Those people had some role. They were discriminated against, but they had some role in societies. They were in part of some sort of hierarchical system. The, people weren't, weren't slaves like in Rome or there wasn't like the Arab slave they trade or commodities. They weren't treated as commodities. They weren't treated as. Well, that's because a commodity is like a definition like under capitalism. So, of course, like people weren't necessarily like. But I mean, like slave slavery had a role in like all sorts of pre-capitalist or even pre-feudal societies. Like, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm saying you never see anything specifically like the African slave trade in a system where capitalism wasn't developing. I guess it maybe it depends, I guess, on how specific you want to make it, but like specifically historically, like the conditions you actually saw on the scale. You, uh, well, I mean, like in Rome, like people were literally the property. They had no they didn't even have legal personhood under like Roman slave systems. I mean, I feel like I've gotten pushed into the terrain now where you're in your element because it's getting, you know, a little heated. Oh, but, sure. Yeah, um, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. It's, I just I guess like my yeah, my main problem just back. But I up really is, like, do believe yeah. that the kind of racism we know comes out of this. I mean, one of the things that socialists believe generally is that the social forms that you see are historically developed and they're developed out of the material relations that we have. Sure, but all of them lead to being like massively exclusionary where either other political people are being So you're oppressed. saying it's uh -huh. like just a part of fixed human nature that, that people are racist. 
Yeah, I think that tribalism is something that's built in. I feel like psychological research shows this. So like, for instance, like we tend to not identify as much with people that look differently than us unless we're socialized with them. So people that are born into cities or are like socialized with other people that look different at early ages especially tend to have much more favorable views of those people. Even the way that we recognize faces can change based on our familiarity with other races. So I'd say like socialization I don't, I don't is really important. I disagree with you that mm -hmm. we have an evolutionary propensity to have a certain sorts of tribal... Yeah. Um, uh, identities, but I would say that we already live in a society where those aren't primary and that the way that those things are expressed has changed dramatically. I mean, we don't always deal with people who are like ourselves. We live in a world where, uh, and this is one of the, the major hurdles for socialism to overcome because there's a, a tendency within socialism to think that localism and uh, decentralization is a major component because there's this desire to kind of get back to what seems natural, which is to deal with a small group of people that you trust. There's a kind of an anarchist tendency mm -hmm. to go in that direction. But the fact is that capitalism has already broken with, I mean, before even capitalism is the tribal uh, identity has been broken, but certainly capitalism is broken with this tribal basis for social organization. I mean, today we don't organize society based on tribal identity primarily we base it on you know the nation state and on where capital is accumulated and th so but i mean like even in like the u.s like poor white people hate poor black people rich white people will hate on rich black people on virtue of race like it seems like there is like a large aspect that exists here like completely independent of class unless somehow class is driving this in an underlying fashion that i just don't see i do think that class is driving the the racial tensions in America much more than tribal identities do because we don't have tribal identities so I can't see how they can really be shaping our wait what do you mean we don't have tribal identities what do we you mean don't, by that? we don't live on a, in a tribal system we're not our, you don't think that like people that live like in a country or world so I come from Nebraska like you don't think that there are people that live here like in kind of like white groups that see like black people or Hispanic people or especially Asian people as like outsiders I do think that but that's not the same thing as living in a tribal system we don't live based on uh, the foods and, and uh, structures that can be produced by small tribes. We live. Oh well, sure. If you're talking about like literally like tribes of people, yeah. Yeah, of right. We like don't. Tribes like tribal identities. Yeah, we don't live that way. We live based well, on. When people, people say tribalism, of people. When people say huh? when people talk about tribalism, they're not talking about like living like in literal tribes with like teepees well, and but stuff, you were right? Talking about the origins of the species shaping our psychology. And all, what I was saying is look, we've already broken from that foundation. We haven't broken already, with inherent tribalism, though. That's like that's still a part of like that's a fundamental part of human nature, right? No, we have propensities to identify with small groups of people based on our ancestral past and what's been beneficial to us in the past. But that doesn't mean that that's any kind of innate part of our nature that's immutable. It's already been mutated. We don't survive based on our tribal affiliations anymore. We base our, our we survive based on our affiliations over massive networks of relationships now. So we're no longer in a tribal society, and those that that doesn't dictate how we operate in, anymore. Okay. Um, all right. Were there any other? I think these are like kind of like the major points that I had. I guess. Yeah. I no. I'd like to come back to this sometime if you have the chance, because I feel like my answers weren't a hundred percent, but I also feel like mm -hmm. very strongly that I'm on the right side of this. That you can't just have a a vision of human nature that isn't found, founded in the material relations between people, that's based on some sort of long-standing, innate structure of the human psychology that can't be mutated. I mean, sure. that's just, I just disagree. And, and I kind of, there's this, this may be a fundamental difference between like people who are, I would say progressives and people who are conservative. Conservatives tend to believe that, you know, there is a fixed human essence and that somehow despite the fact that our society as it is is constantly changing that it maintains itself this fixed human essence really is what's controlling our relations despite the fact that our relations are changing all the time mm -hmm. so anyway that would be my uh uh last comment on 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 this debate but listen i um i feel like i you pushed me into the one area where i might start to get defensive yeah, no, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not trying to like debate you out of any area or whatever. I'm just, these right. are just like the class reductionism is a big thing that comes up a lot that I'm really curious about. So Yeah, I just don't think that it's, that 
class reductionism exists where people treat class as an identity and it isn't right whether or not you're working class isn't really based on what you think about yourself and it isn't the kind of person you are it's your relationship mm -hmm. to well, the means of production in society. Yeah, but the, so the idea behind class reduction is, or my understanding of the idea is that basically all of these issues in society that we have, either if it's with women or other minority groups, are reducible to some class thing. That that's like the that's the thing. The origin of these problems is some sort of class conflict. In, when it, in it, when it comes to the origins of prejudice, that is not the case. When it comes to specifically to the problems with with women and men, the gender relations and inequality between the genders. That's certainly not the case, but that doesn't mean that socialism wouldn't overcome those problems. That getting like the class system already has broken down the patriarchal mm. structure that used to run the world. That we're already seeing massive strides forward for women's emancipation, just based on market forces, just based on the progressive nature of capitalism. So. You know, to to think that uh, overcoming the contradictions within capitalism towards a classless society wouldn't overcome uh, the, what remains of patriarchal authority, I think is you'd have to make a pretty strong argument as to why patriarchal authority would survive that when it's not even surviving very well under capitalism. Well, sure. I, yeah, I mean, that's kind of branches into a whole other argument, but okay. Right. <laughs> right. All right, cool. I mean, this is where I think, you know, you start to... <laughs> You've entered to the, into the train where I, I'm in a recognizable, heated debate. Oh, no, <laughs> it's just a conversation. Not just with you, but no just one... like on the left. This is like sure. something that comes up a lot. Um, all right, but yeah, it was fun talking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd love to come back anytime. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just message me whenever. So if I don't respond, I'm really I'm much better at Discord than uh, Twitter because I, I get a ton of random Twitter DMs, so I, I don't always see those. But yeah. Okay. All right. Well, all right, talk to you later. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'll see you later, bye. Bye. <sighs> All right, Kim. <laughs> I, I don't know. We can't possibly have evolved out of tribalism in this short amount of time. Well, of course not. But we, it seemed like we started to switch around tribalism to mean living in literal tribes. I guess I, I don't. I don't understand how that happened. Oh. This guy was, like, really polite, so I didn't want to, like, go hard on him like I did with Caleb. But it was pretty annoying when he was saying that I was, like, pushing him into an area. I still feel like I should have done the thing where I answer the question that I ask him. Like, if I, if I ask you, like, well, if the majority of your society is white and it's ultra-democratic, what protects the black people? Well, this is a very fringe area. This is, like, super fringe. I don't have the exact answers. Like, okay, well, like, I feel like this is a pretty fundamental thing. Like, this is a pretty... It's not like a super... Con I'm not asking you to, like, give me the top-to-bottom view of, like, your judicial system. I'm just, like, curious, like, how do you solve for these problems? Like... Yeah, well, yeah, 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 we're complaining so much, though. Material interest doesn't mean profit for capitalists. These two things are not the same.